welcome to the show, Oscar Trimboli. Wrote the book, Deep Listening, Impact Beyond Words, executive coach, speaker, and author living in beautiful Sydney, Australia. It is a pleasure to welcome you to the show, Oscar. G'day, guys. And I have to say, it is perfect timing that we have you on the show because last month we covered emotional bids in great detail and learning how to actually listen on an emotional level. And we got a great number of questions in from our audience, really focusing on the art of listening, how to become a more effective and impactful listener. And I know that some of us listening to the show right now may have even gotten some feedback on their listening or lack thereof, uh, myself included. So I'm excited to dig into the science of listening. And one of the things that really jumped out at us in the book itself was this great insight, how the moment we are born and utter our first primal scream coming out of the womb, we spend the rest of our lives trying to be heard by others and we don't really spend enough time learning how to listen to others. And I thought that was really insightful. You know, one of the first skills we learn inside our mother's womb at 25 weeks is how to listen out for the sound of our mum. And at 32 weeks, we can distinguish Beethoven from Bon Jovi. So being able to listen deeply is our birthright. But the minute we're born, we completely forget it because we want to come into the world kicking and screaming and being noticed. Uh, in Australia, we don't have teachers at school that teach us how to listen. That might be different in the US. We have people who teach us how to do math. We have people who teach us English. Yet the skill we spend 55% of our day doing listening, only 2% of the world has ever been trained in how to do. And you know that's one of the things I'm extraordinarily passionate about is being thoughtful, deliberate listeners and, and creating 100 million deep listeners in the world by 2030. Well, as your eyes and ears here in America, I can tell you that that same problem exists here as well. There is no one teaching anyone how to listen. And one of the, a lot of the letters, the emails that we got last week were people who shared the emotional bids episode uh, uh, statically with their partners and with people and only to hear, well, yeah, because you don't listen to anybody, right? <laughs> I was like, wait, I was sharing that with you to let you know that you weren't re responding and validating any of my emotional bits. So obviously there's a lot for everyone to learn from our conversation today. And what I think is so fascinating about all of this is we are graded on our ability to listen. So your yeah. ability to listening, you get graded in school. And then when you enter the workforce, if you're not listening to your boss, if you're not listening to what the team needs are, you're not going to fit in and you're going to fall behind and ultimately be let go. So this skill set that we're going to dig into is so impactful in every relationship in our lives. And it really starts with listening to ourselves. I know a lot of us don't even take the time to listen to our own thoughts and in our week-long training here in Los Angeles, one of the first things that we dig into is identifying what your values are and understanding who you are on a greater level so that you can actually pay closer attention to others. Some of us are having that struggle internally. And what I loved about the book was you broke listeners down into, you broke unconscious listeners down into four types. And could you describe them for our audience? Yeah, I, I call them the villains of listening or more importantly, the audiences that I worked with over the time I've developed this content started to say these are these are the villains because we have language in maths. We have division, we have multiplication, we have subtraction, we have all this uh, syntax to use, but nobody knows how to describe a listener. So the listening villains are the dramatic listener, the lost listener the interrupting listener and the shrewd listener. And each of them have very different characteristics. While you're listening to this, think deeply about the person who's the most frustrating person who doesn't listen to you and see where they fit into this four villains of listening. The lost listener is completely detached. They seem really vague. They're not even sure if they should be talking to you or if they are, they're not really paying attention in the moment. These people will tend to say things like, sorry, um, could you say that again? Um, I, I'm not sure what you mean. Could you say that again? 
or they just have this very vague look on their face. The, the second listener is the dramatic listener. They love your story because it creates a theatre in which they can tell a much bigger story. So I was reminded by Mary, who told me the story about a dramatic listener. She went in and saw her manager to complain about one of her staff members not doing a particular task. And all her boss did was take that and go, boy, you think you got problems, and then started to list 14 other problems that she had. So she wasn't really interested in Mary or what Mary had to say. She wasn't listening. She was just creating a platform for her next drama. The most obvious listener we all kind of think about is the interrupting listener. They're visual. They are interrupting us. The minute we draw breath, that's their commercial break to (laughs) give us their opinion. And the interrupting listener I love because people can see them. They're overt. They're transparent. And that's the easiest one to work with. The final one is the shrewd listener. Shrewd listener is disproportionately represented in the medical profession, in the sales profession, any kind of consulting profession. And what the shrewd listener is, is very careful. Think about somebody who's stroking their chin. (laughs) They're nodding sagely. And all they're doing is going, you think that's your problem? (laughs) Once I solve that problem, I've got three other problems. You're so dumb, you haven't even thought about. And what they're missing while they're formulating the solution to the problem is they're not actually listening to what that other person's saying. So these four villains, when you were thinking about who they are, one of the funny things about this exercise is listening is situational and listening is relational. You listen to your boss differently than you listen to somebody you work with. You listen to your parents differently than you listen to your children, or you might listen to a sales rep differently to somebody you're going out on a first date with. But in all those cases, you are one of those four listening villains. When you struggle, you're going to struggle with one of those four things. And the lost listener is the place that most of us need to start because we turn up to a conversation with a story already in our head, either the story we haven't left behind from the last conversation we had or the story we're making up when we come into the next conversation. So the difference between a good listener and a great listener, the difference between somebody who's a shallow listener and a deep listener is somebody who understands the 125-400 rule, the simple maths and neuroscience of the fact that we speak at roughly 125 words a minute, but we can listen to up to 400 words a minute. So a good listener gets distracted because they're filling in the other 300 words while we're speaking. In fact, it's happening to some of you right now. You're driving along and you've missed the conversation. Some of you are cooking right now and you're thinking about, gee, I hope this meal gets made in time. And even for our hosts right now, they're probably thinking about the next question. So there is a four villains of listening. Well, reading this and going over this for the show, obviously the ones that I feel that I suffer from. And of course, then you have to look at the people around you, what you suspect that their type of listening is. And right out of the gate, I mean, the interrupting listeners spoke to me immediately. And of course the shrewd listener spoke to me immediately. And I was like, uh, but the best thing about this is listening, them, listing them as unconscious acts, being able to, to zero in on, which one you're guilty of and then being able to see it for what it is. And then as we're, as we will venture forward today, being able to put some pieces that together to help be a better listener. And and I think ultimately for all of us, we see in color, but we listen in black and white. So we only really ever think about listening for content, either audio or visual. And the five levels of listening are helping people understand that listening is so much more than nodding, saying, "Mm mm-hmm, tell me more about that. That's such a superficial level of listening. It's a great start, but most of us listen in black and white, and I'm trying to teach the world how to listen in color. And what's so interesting about all of this is that situational component that a lot of us don't think about. We like to think we're good listeners all the time, but I can definitely think about the moments where I'm half listening because I don't really need to pay attention to that commercial on TV, 
or I'm fully intently listening because I want to get this value from my business coach. So when we start to unpack the unconscious behaviors that we have around listening and the situationalness of that, I don't even know if that's a word, the, <laughs> the fact that it's so situational and that sometimes our listening skills are really going to be there and sometimes they're not going to be there. We can actually start to work in this area to improve. And our audience, I know, is listening along to us. So they're excited to learn how to become better listeners. And what you touched on earlier there, the science behind listening, realizing that, yes, we are speaking at 125 words, but our mind's ability to process at 400 words a minute is pretty amazing when we think about it. I, th I, th I thought that number was brilliant. I've seen that before. But the other thing that I was thinking about when he was talking about the situationals, the, the, the situation listening, and coming back to this podcast, right, we're talking about how people listen to this. And I know many friends who listen to podcasts on two times the speed, three and I'm like, how are you able to review concepts and look at things from different perspectives if you're just plowing through content at such a rate? And I think, you know, that's such a microcosm of of how we listen to our friends and then and our and our loved ones emotional bids yeah one of the things I, I say to people is treat silence like it's another word listen fully and completely to silence and treat it respectfully like it is a word rather than a space to interrupt just by the way on the two times speed um you can listen to up to three times speed. So particularly blind people can listen at a much faster speed than sighted people because they've already figured out how to process quicker. Sure. So uh, for others that might listen to podcasts at two times speed, they can only do that if the accent is something that they're familiar with. So you might start at one time speed, then you can move to two X speed, uh, sorry, one and a half speed and then two X speed. But as long as you can understand the inclinations in the voice, you can move your speed up. So the the wonderful thing about the two X speed in podcasting, it proves the 125, 400 rule. And I know a couple of blind people who, ha who have full comprehension at 300 words a minute. So listening, because we haven't been taught, provides such a huge cognitive load when we go through the process of trying to understand deeply. And here's two really simple hacks to think about from your body's perspective. And the third tip is so practical, you're just gonna hit your forehead. So tip number one, in 1993 in Canada, and this research has been replicated in the US, Germany, and the Netherlands over decades since, the deeper you breathe, the deeper you listen. And the science is really simple because it's such a cognitive load for your mind, getting more oxygen to the brain helps you to listen better. There's less distraction. And I know you guys teach this and have had other brilliant guests on that talk to this much better. But it's a simple fact of holding your breath a little bit longer. So for me, it's not you taking and sitting down and moving into a yoga position before you start to listen to people. For me, it's as simple as from the time I step into a building lobby to the time I get to the lift, I become completely conscious of my breathing. And as a result, that starts to block out other distracting thoughts in my head. So tip number one, the deeper you breathe, the deeper you listen. You only have to hold it for five seconds longer to help the brain create the rinse cycle that is the washing machine before listening. The second tip is a hydrated brain is a more effective brain. So for a lot of us, we might start the morning with coffee and that's great. Personally, I don't, but if you can drink two liters of water a day, your brain's gonna be able to process more effectively because the fluids that transmit sugars to the brain get there quicker. So tip number one, breathe deeper. Tip number two, drink water. The final tip seems really obvious. It's so obvious that people don't do it. Announce to your guest that you are switching off your phone and put it in your bag or in your waistcoat pocket or wherever it needs to be. But by announcing that intention, straight away they go, I cannot believe that someone's gonna do that for me. What an act 
of sheer generosity to give me your complete attention. Now, I challenge everybody who's listening right now. I challenge you to do that once a day for the next week and notice how different that conversation becomes. Because if you're really listening, what will be the opportunity for you to change your thinking because you're listening completely to the other person? So tip number one, breathe deeply. Tip number two, drink water. And tip number three, announce and switch off, not vibrate mode, switch off your cell phone and you will transform the kinds of conversations you have no matter who you're having them with. I love that and I cannot wait to experiment with that and I'm automatically thinking about a particular conversation that I have to have this evening that I'm going to use that and I I think we rail on social media and technology a lot but there is obviously a reason for it and I love that you had said that. That is a wonderful thing to hear. And I think of a lot of people go about their day turning off their phone for important conversations we might be in a better place well i've the funny part about that is i've then struggled with the phantom vibrate <laughs> where even your phone is off so amy and i go on date nights on friday night and i try to turn my phone off completely and unplug and be fully present and i'm sitting there with my phone in my pocket i know it's off and it's still feeling like it's vibrating right and it's still on the back of your mind like i gotta get to this thing so the more Take of that practice, of yeah, the more of that practice and doing it for a week straight instead of just doing it on the yeah. oddball uh, situation, you're going to actually start to be more devotional in your practice of listening, which I think is really important. Yeah, and you, you're right. It's a practice. You need to develop listening muscles. And like any other muscle, the first time you use them, it's going to be a struggle. The first time you go into a gym, um, it's going to be a different experience on your muscles and the same is true for listening but there's a great story from two years ago I was working with an executive in a in an organization it was really complex and I sat down and explained what I did and he hired me and three meetings in he says his name was Mike and he says I got a bone to pick with you Oscar he says you nearly caused me a divorce and I said, I'm confused, Mike. You, you know I was explicit and said, do not try any of these techniques at home. These are all for the workplace. And he said, you know, for two weeks, I've put my phone down. I've switched it off. I've really looked deeply into my wife's eyes. And you know what she said last Friday? She asked me if I'm having an affair. <laughs> and I was completely blown away. And I paused. I waited for a bit of silence like you taught me. And he said, lovely question, I'm curious what's caused you to change your perspective. And she said, you've never paid me this much attention. You must be cheating on me. And he knows from that point on, not only their marriage is transformed, but also the way they interact with their children has transformed because from the time they get home, the, both parents get home with the children, to the time they finish dinner, it's a completely device-free zone. And that's changed the dynamic in the family. So um, sometimes teaching people how to listen has some unintended consequences, as it did for Mike, but a happy ending in that case. <laughs> it's funny how we build up these habits in our communication as well with the people around us and they come to expect certain things and all of a sudden you're working on improving you're turning towards emotional bids and the other person's like well wait a second here uh you're paying too close attention to me uh, something's off we got a great question here from a listener thomas hey aj and johnny this is thomas from austria here's my problem i'm often facing when i'm in conversation Every now and then my mind simply wanders off and I think about if and when I ever was in such a situation as the person I'm talking to is currently. So I do listen to the other person, but at the same time, I'm thinking of a ton of other things. Any advice on how I can become more present and engaged in conversation? Great question, Thomas from Austria, not to be confused with Australia. So that's terrific. <laughs> I think that uh, we want to do two things when we go to school we're actually taught to look for similarities rather than look for differences particularly in conversation so one of the things I would encourage you to do is just give yourself over completely to the dialogue not try and form an opinion and, and a simple technique to do this is to listen for patterns rather than just the words 
So are they always speaking in the past? Are they always speaking in the future? Are they speaking about themselves individually? Are they speaking about groups? Are they speaking about positive, negative? Are they speaking about things in patterns? If you start to listen, not only for the words they're saying, but the patterns, that will put another hundred words for you to start to think about while you're listening and you won't become distracted. So the intention you want to walk in with, Thomas, is not only what are they saying, but what are the patterns in what they're saying? And then a simple question you can pose to them sometimes, don't do it all the time or you come across as a bit of a shrewd listener, is I've noticed some patterns in what you've just said and just pause because a lot of times they'll say what the pattern is and that'll be different to the pattern you even notice. Then offer them the opportunity to say, do you mind if I share the pattern I noticed? And all of a sudden, your dialogue takes a completely different path because it's not only about what's being said that matters, it's also about exploring what's unsaid. And if you can start to explore the unsaid, you'll get less distracted. Don't forget the three tips we already talked about. The deeper you breathe, the deeper you listen, drink some water and switch off that cell phone. You know, I love that. One of the things that we do in program, uh, everyone who comes through has to fill out a, a, a form of why they're there and what they want to work on and what they feel that their uh, issues and challenges are. And that gives us some insight before they come in. But even though we have that information, we still want to hear it from their mouths when they're sitting yeah. on that couch because the language that they use in that situation tells uh, tells us a lot about how they view the situation and where they're at in that, in that, at that time. Yeah, and really powerful leaders in commerce or really powerful listeners in politics, listen to what's unsaid. And uh, you only have to look to your 2016 election to see someone who paid attention to the voices that weren't being heard and harnessing the power of that. And it's so fascinating how when we have this extra 275 words to play with here, how if we can put our focus on the right things, looking for patterns, like you said, we can actually dedicate more resources to the listening instead of allowing those distractions to easily catch our you know, side glance and all of a sudden we're, we're losing control of the situation. I think what we find time and time again is we're always in search of these patterns and then we're trying to for, uh, trying to become more empathetic and think about ways that we can relate to people. And oftentimes in that forcing of patterns and thinking about these different ways, it's very easy for us to get off course and not be paying full attention to the person we're talking to. Yeah, and that's the, the thing about listening to yourself. Uh, Chinese have a character to describe two words, to listen. So they make listening a very active action not a passive hearing and the, if you decompose the characters of ting two are physical to hear and to see but then there are other components the component of focus the component of feeling and the component of heart so for them listening is a five-dimensional action rather than a passive act of hearing. So for all of us, is our heart in the conversation or just our head? Deep listeners are fully committed, not just to who's speaking, but to the dialogue. Again, I'd say one of the distinctions between good listeners and great listeners, between shallow listeners and deep listeners, deep listeners listen to the dialogue not just the person talking. And the distinction is, is this dialogue progressing or are we just like two table tennis players ping-ponging back a ball across the table? We're not really making progress, but we're using a lot of energy to get our position across. If you're listening to the dialogue, you'll start to ask questions like, compared to when we started, are we making progress? Between now and when we need to finish, what would you like to cover off? And that helps to triangulate the conversation, much like the GPS satellites that circle the world, 
to go, where should we be? Where are we now? Where should we be? Where are we now? A lot of time we're just stuck in this dialogic inner change that feels like a table tennis or a ping pong bat and ball just going across the table, creating a perspective where you start to go up and look at the conversation like a satellite is powerful. It's transformational. It's really deep. I love that advice. Thank you for sharing that with our listeners. Next, we have a very interesting question from Danielle in Colombia. Danielle in Colombia says, I wanted to ask, is there something that I can do with my body language so my brain goes into listening mode? And also, what are some ways to show the other person that I am really listening? Great question. What the research says way back from the 1950s, even up until today, is the person speaking believes that visual cues are a better indication of listening than paraphrasing as an example or, or summarizing. So number one, sit at body language if you, uh, sorry, sit at body level um, when you're speaking to someone. We saw an atrocious example of this recently when we saw Serena Williams at the US Open at Flushing Meadow. Now, for those of you who hadn't had an opportunity to see what happened, she had a chance to become the greatest of all time by winning the US Open. There was an issue where she was being coached and the chair umpire called her out. The chair umpire issued her a warning and Serena Williams came up to the chair umpire to ask for an explanation. Now, both are right and both are wrong, but it was a really poor listening environment because the chair umpire stayed in their chair and like a parent looking down on a child, looked down on Serena Williams. And that body language and that body position created distrust straight away that Serena felt she wasn't being listened to. So make sure your eye contact is actually at eye level. Sounds super basic, but you'd be surprised how many people do it. The second thing is keep your feet flat on the floor to create a sense of centeredness to help improve your breathing. Keep both hands on the table if you're in that kind of an environment. Or if you're in a, in a mixer or you're in an environment where you might be enjoying a wine or a, or a beverage, um, feel free to make sure that your glass is at their glass level which will help your eye contact be at their eye level. And the reason eye, eye levels are really important, it just aligns your ears to theirs and it makes it much easier for you to listen. The same is true for children. If, you, if you're listening to this and you've got children and you travel a lot for your work, if you call your children, don't call them standing up. Make sure you're sitting at their eye level, whatever height they would be. So if you're in a hotel room, you might need to sit on the bed or kneel down. Um, some people might need to sit cross-legged. So your body position is a really clear cue and indicator to the other person that you're listening. Face front on, have eye contact as close to eye level for both parties as possible. And that will be a huge signal based on the research about they will feel you listen better, Danielle. It is great to see such simple things having such a large impact um, on something such as listening or even being able to feel for others to feel good that you're listening. Certain things like having closed off body language we talk about all the time in classes and how a lot of people's unconscious body language of something that they do that allows them to feel comfortable puts other people at, at a position where they don't feel they're being heard because the person they're speaking to is closed off, has their arms folded, or how that closed off body language even puts them in a position when they're in a social environment of closing themselves off to hearing the, the emotional con content and atmosphere of the room. And, and we've just seen a great example of this. And Right now, we can't see each other and we are struggling because we can't make eye contact. It's a primal human requirement because eye contact is the first trust indicator. If I can't see anything in your hands, I know you're not going to kill me. And if you're not <laughs> going to kill me, then I probably want to have a conversation with you right now. So again, for people in, in business, uh, one of the things I would say, whenever you've got an opportunity, use FaceTime or use a webinar that, or Zoom or any of those tools that allow you Skype to allow you to not only speak 
audio but also visual as our world becomes smaller it becomes more disconnected rather than more connected because these technologies are breaking down some of the more important assets that we require to listen better i think we're all learning how to communicate better through technology because we've all have found ourselves in trouble because context and and other things emotional content has been missing from a lot of these conversations and i remember i had a boss when i was a much younger man who who liked to do most of his business through email but also had gotten into a lot of trouble through email because of the nuance of lost in that communication and i remember many drama filled evenings that were all because of technology rather than two people who live down the road from each other having a beer at the bar and, dis- and discussing and having it out face to face. Yeah. And, you know, whether it's doctors or salespeople or judges, the, there's some research that's being done about all the listening research. So I know that gets a bit meta meta but basically in uh, the university in Jerusalem the Hebrew University Avi Kluger has done a study of all listening studies and the correlations are quite potent doctors on average interrupt their patient in the first 20 seconds and great doctors that listen listen for 90 seconds before interrupting their patients so it's not actually a long time but doctors who listen and up to 90 seconds have a 10 times less chance of having a malpractice suit against them Salespeople who listen more deeply are 38 percent more productive than those that don't there's an amazing piece of research and technology allows this to be done now that analyze 25,000 sales calls that were all recorded and a computer transcribed them and it analyzed the talk versus listen ratio and great salespeople listened in a ratio over the time of the call 54% listening 46% speaking at the beginning of the call the speak ratio was lower and at the end of the call, the listening ratio was high. So on average, these calls lasted up to 10 minutes. But now that we have all this amazing data that tells us that the sales reps in those cases that listen closer to the ratio of 54-46 outperform the average, not the whole group, just the average by eight times. So we can see the commercial implications of that, but we can also see that in personal relationships as well. There's a great story from Lego, and Lego in 2000s was going broke. Um, They were struggling. Lego has theme parks. They had to sell them to keep the company afloat, and they decided that they would create a Lego movie. And most of you will know of the Lego movie franchise, but the very first movie was a complete disaster. It was called The Adventures of Crash Craddock, and its box office success was $69,000. They sold a few DVDs. So the CEO decided that he needed a different approach. He hired the directors from the blockbuster movie called 21 Jump Street. So no Oscar award-winning Uh, directors behind this whatsoever but what Lord and Miller the two directors decided to do there's this cult in Lego called adult fans of Lego and they meet on weekends and they play with their Legos and they build structures and they swap ideas Lord and Miller spent six months just going around Europe Japan and the United States listening in while these people were building Lego and there's this bad character in Lego land that uses glue. So for the Lego aficionados <laughs> out there, using glue is bad. But because Lord and Miller were listening down at this level, they created a whole subplot in the movie that the adult fans of Lego went out and promoted to their friends who weren't Lego fans and created a movement. The point being, out of that, they created a billion dollar movie franchise, now done six movies. They created a half a billion dollar computer software game franchise, and they added nearly $2 billion to Lego revenue, all because they listened to the adult fans of Lego. 
and the fact that glue shouldn't be used when it comes to Lego. So I learned something about <laughs> Lego when it comes to that. So listening has massive impact when it's done well. Listening also has massive impact when it's done poorly. And again, um, some people might venture to say that the 2016 presidential election in the U.S. was more a failure of listening than anything else. That is amazing. And it just it brought up a point that when the next week we have an interview with Michael Ventura, who has with his book applied empathy and all about listening to the consumer in order to to move your company forward to to find out what it exactly is that they're looking for from your company i mean if they're a fan of your brand they're going to want certain things and and you're going to need to become a good listener in order to find out what what that is yeah when i when i spoke to the head of Asia Pacific research for Nike and Coca-Cola, Vanessa, she said, most market research is something that keeps the door open. It's a $100,000 dead weight that gets printed out and never gets read. Or if it does get read, it never gets actioned. And her tip was really simple. If you want to become empathetic and really listen to your customers, go and watch them. She talked about Toyota. And one of the things Toyota did, their engineers just went and watched people at the uh, supermarkets and the malls. And one of the things they noticed was both women and men struggled with putting groceries into the trunk of the car. And that's because there was a lip across the boot of a Toyota. Now you'll notice in more modern versions of Toyotas, it's actually flat because it makes it easier to load the groceries in. But they only learned that by watching. And watching is a great form of listening. One of our listeners has a question when interrupting too much. Alex asks, I'd love to ask if you have any tips on making the other person more comfortable in conversation. I sometimes feel like when I'm talking to someone, they already try to think of something ahead of time. And I want to know that this is not a competition about the smartest comment, but that it's about two people listening to each other. Do you have any advice on how I could do that? Yeah. Alex, great question. Think about treating silence as you would another word. Give it the respect it deserves. The pause will allow both minds to catch up in the conversation. For a lot of us, we don't treat the pause with reverence. If you go to Korea or Japan or China, you'll notice that silence is a really important part of the dialogue because it allows both parties to reflect and progress in the west it's not honored in the west uh, listening to the silence is something we need we think we need to fill so number one be comfortable with the silence and then the other thing is just be comfortable in asking simple questions like are you getting what you need out of this conversation it doesn't matter what you're talking about. It doesn't matter what point the debate's at. It doesn't matter where you are in a relationship. Halfway through a conversation, if you feel like it's off track for you or them, simply ask them that question. Are you getting what you need out of this conversation? I love that you mentioned that about the, here in the West, how people tend to, to feel that they need to fill that space. Uh, we see it in our classrooms all the time uh, <clears throat> where if there is that uncomfortable silence, we see the, the party tr f freaking out a bit. And, and, and then, of course, when trying to fill it, digs a bigger hole for themselves. And, and we've always said that it's a very masculine thing. It's a very, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a moving forward thing about learning how to feel comfortable in that silence and allowing that, that the interaction to breathe. And I know for myself, when given the opportunity to relax, to think about what I'm going to say, uh, I feel better, the conversation moves better, and I, it, it's something that all of us should learn to get more comfortable with. And this idea around awkward silence, yeah, right? it's exactly. labeled as awkward, so everyone wants to feel it, <laughs> when mm. actually the best speakers use silence to their advantage. Those pauses can be very helpful to allow both parties, as you said, to catch up to the conversation instead of racing to interject that next item. Even in music, when it comes to put laying your solo on the, on the song in the studio, 
you know, everyone who wants to make this song work knows it's not about the notes that you play. It's about the notes that you don't play. I love that. The notes that you don't play. Chris wants to know, would love to hear your thoughts on how to actively listen when networking. Often I find it hard to focus on the conversation when I'm trying to think of talking points simultaneously. Sounds a bit like he's really concerned about pitching himself and looking the part in front of these people. And when we get so hung up on the words that we're going to say, it can be very difficult to follow along. The, the great thing about it being at a networking event, it's always organized around content. You might be going to a social media conference. You might be going to the librarian conference. You might be going to the mums about to have twins conference. The reality is you always can use the context, which is the third level of listening, to help the dialogue progress really easy. It's also about moving your attention away from being attention in on yourself and being attention out, not just on the speaker, but also on the dialogue. So a really simple question is, hey, what brought you to this event today and what are you hoping to achieve from attending? That's a great question because it's going to unify both of you into the conversation as opposed to that awkward question, you know, what do you do on your weekend and uh, how long have you lived in town? That doesn't create a connection, but the context that you're part of is. So learning to ask really simple what and how based questions around the context in which you operate in at a networking event will make you sound like somebody they want to listen to as well as you wanting to listen to what their answer is. And we need to realize that questions are actually impactful in this setting. Most of us try to prepare our perfect pitch and what we're going to say in the elevator and how we're going to prepare so that we sound amazing. And we leave out the fact that everyone wants to talk. Everyone wants to share. So if we can use questions, especially as an introvert, someone who struggles to feel comfortable in those settings, using questions can be a really powerful way to get the audience engaged and allow them to feel great around you because they get a chance to talk about their favorite topic, which is themselves. I, I think no one ever has a shortage of stories to tell about themselves, but what they worry about is are those stories selfish or serving? And again, if your questions can create the context for that to land in, it's the difference between dropping seeds into fertile ground or dropping seeds into cement. One's going to flourish and one's not. So dropping seeds into a fertile ground, it means the dialogue will expand. Equally, that question that I pose, what brings you to this event? What do you want to achieve? If you're in a group of three or four standing in a circle, as we do at these events, it's going to draw everybody else into the conversation as well. So that question is not just designed for who you're speaking to, but it's also designed to help the other people listen to the conversation rather than to tune out. Now, when we think of listening, we often hear the word active listening. I need to be an active listener. And in the book, you break it down into five levels of listening. And I'd love to unpack those for the audience because they really are powerful. And as I started to make my way through them, I realized that these are some of the concepts that a lot of us struggle with when we are introverted and we're so worried about the way we're perceived and what's being said about us. Yeah, and, and be careful with the, the label. Introverts are as poor listeners as <laughs> extroverts are. Uh, we, they just orientate their listening a little bit differently. So uh, I'm all for labels if they're productive. Uh, and so let's, let's use them in a productive way. I think introverts have made great contributions to the world. Extroverts have too. It's when is it appropriate is the big question. So as a card carrying member of the introvert community, there's nothing I like more than being by myself writing a book as opposed to reading one. Um, so the, the, the five levels of listening are listening to yourself, listening to the content, listening for the context, listening for the meaning, and listening for what's unsaid. These are the five levels of listening. I've undertaken a piece of research over the last six months. I've, I've researched 1,462 people. And what the data tells me consistently is most people 
only listen to the content. 86% of people watch and listen to a dialogue. So 86% of people listen at the level of level two, which is listening to the content. That's okay, but that's also my point. Most of us listen in black and white rather than listening in color. So the first level of listening is listening to yourself. And those three tips that I provided earlier are gonna help you understand how to create a surface area where you can receive dialogue. If you breathe deeply, if you drink water, and if you switch off your cell phone, you'll be in a place where you can actually hear what the other person's saying. Unfortunately, a lot of us turn up to the dialogue like we've got our iPhone earbuds in and we're <laughs> hearing a conversation in our own head. We're not even available to the other person. They don't know there's a movie going on in our head called Cliffhanger or, or uh, The Greatest Disaster or Survivor. These are all things that might be going through our head from the last conversation or the next conversation. So being completely present in the conversation that you're in is about your attention being out rather than being in. For most people, they hear these terms active listening and most literature in this space is written around level two listening. How to watch for body language, how to listen, how to paraphrase, how to summarize, how to ask some questions. And that's great. It's a great starting point for all of us. Level three, listening listening for the context. One of the most powerful questions we can always ask is, sometimes we turn up to a conversation and we feel like we've joined a movie about halfway through. We don't know who the characters are, how they developed. We don't really know the backstory. And in coming into the conversation so far down the track, we're confused and we're trying to fill in the gaps. We're, who's this character and what are they doing and are they the good guys or the bad guys a simple question would be hey could we just go back could you just take me back to the beginning of this story and where this all started there's a simple example of a what question and in doing that getting the backstory starts to create a more relevant context for the conversation one of the jobs of a great listener is to help the speaker explain what they're trying to say in a way that can be heard rather than how they think about it. So level three, listening for the context is also listening for patterns. One of the patterns you'll notice, some people will always talk about themselves or some people will always talk about their families. Some people will always talk about weekends or work days. Some people will talk about holidays or work. So just simply noticing some of those patterns will help you. Some people talk in pictures, stories, metaphors, and analogies. And some people speak sequentially, logically. They talk about things that are very evidence-based. So if you can listen at that level, you can start to dialogue in a way that's empathetic to them. The most powerful listening level, I believe, is level four, listening for what's unsaid. That's about exploring the other 300 words in the speaker's mind that they haven't said because they're blocked by the 125-400 rule. They'd love to be able to speak at 400 words a minute so they can get everything out. And then finally, listening for meaning. This is brought home to me by a story two years ago. I was working with a company. We were working with the leadership team and I asked them to explain if our company that we were working with was an animal, what kind of animal would it be? And the men in the room described it as an eagle or an osprey, and they're all amazing flying birds of prey. And then there was one person who didn't speak. And before we moved on, I turned to Ellen and I said, Ellen, I noticed you haven't spoken yet. And She's a card-carrying member of the introvert community. <laughs> and uh, by the way, for the public speakers out there, whenever you ask people at an event to put their hands up, the introverts are not <laughs> going to put their hands up. So that's the easiest way to figure out what your audience mix is like. And I came back to Ellen and I said, I'm curious what you're thinking right now. And she said, our company is like a snake. And you could hear a pin drop. 
because you had everybody describing eagles and osprey and all these amazing flying elegant creatures and she described the company as a snake and i said tell me more and she said oh isn't it obvious and you could look around the room at all the men in the room and it wasn't obvious to them they're all thinking snake are we slimy are we (laughs) evil are we gonna come up behind and sneak up on the customer and she said no we are a snake every season we shed our skin and we evolve into something different every season because we serve our customers our ability to change is our most amazing asset don't you all see that and all of a sudden you could hear the breathing of the room come out. <laughs> and everybody just went yeah we yeah we do we we adapt we're really good at that and that's why our customers buy us and as a result their product code names are all named after snakes they have little beanie uh soft toy snakes that go around the office and they have snakes (laughs) included in their in their sales presentations and that simple statement of listening to what was unsaid but explaining what it meant completely transformed that company they were going at a revenue growth rate of 20 percent and they knew they had more in them. And for the next two years, which is where we're up to today, they grew 50% last year and they're on track to grow 80% this year, all because we listened to somebody who wouldn't normally be heard and explain the meaning behind a snake. How many times are you in conversations where you don't listen enough to understand the meaning behind someone says and ask them, what does a snake mean to them? And I think in all those levels of listening, if understanding that they're all foundational, you cannot achieve competence on the level above it until you've achieved mastery on the level below. Most of us are at the first two levels of listening. Switch off your phone, drink water, breathe deeply. You'll start to achieve mastery in listening to yourself. There's so many amazing points in that story. And the one that stuck out to me most is when you are drinking water you're turning off your phone you're able to breathe then you can work through this for instance at the point where she didn't speak rather than anyone just going to be to be presumptuous and assuming something about how she felt or what was going on they decided to to ask her and let her articulate her full story and stance because she at any point she could have been cut off first of all to even have her speak up because they could have just interjected put something there then when she said snake there was another opportunity to go with the very first thing of how they saw it and then the opportunity of her being able to articulate what what that meant to her uh, as being for the the shedding of the snake and all that and at how many points in that story if people weren't listening could it have gone awry? Yeah. And I had a really simple example six months ago in a workshop. Uh, a leader got up to introduce the workshop and talk about where he didn't listen in the past. And he, he was frustrated by a lady in his team called Kim. And for 12 months, Kim would turn up to every birthday celebration, sing happy birthday with gusto, collect money, make sure everybody's birthday was recognized. And he never could understand why she wouldn't tell him when his when her birthday was and he was really frustrated he was annoyed he was disappointed so i just said to him why don't you be elegant empathetic and go into a one-on-one conversation and just explore it just a little bit just gently just a little <laughs> bit more and what he did was he asked him he said look you sing happy birthday for everybody every time i ask you when your birthday is you change the subject or you deflect to somebody else help me understand what that's about and she said when i was born was the same day my mother died my mother died giving birth to me so my birthday reminds me of my mother's death it's not a time for me to celebrate i was raised by my grandparents but i will trust you my birthday is february 18 and now that I've told you, 
we should decide together whether we celebrate it, my birthday or not. And the meaning behind birthdays changed dramatically from that point on for that person because they took the time to listen to what does birthday mean for them. The last question we got here is from Twitter. Jack Griffin asks, when it comes to listening in conversation, I sometimes find myself trying to interject while the other person is speaking. What are some tips or ways to at least remember to just let the other person speak without trying to get my opinion in as well? Yeah. Great question. So create an inverted triangle from the eyebrows to the chin and keep your eyes in that zone. Watch their lips, but watch their eyes and keep your watch in that zone. And when they have finished speaking, rather than jumping in, just hold that triangle for three seconds longer. Quite often you'll find that they want to say more but because you've interrupted them, they can't. Distracting yourself by looking at this inverted triangle between your eyebrows and your chin will keep you on track and give you a simple practical exercise to do while you're listening to them and filling in those extra 275 words. I love that in order to become a better listener, we have to find smarter ways to distract ourselves <laughs> so that we can stay focused on the words <clears throat> the context, and those things that are unsaid, as well as the deeper meaning. Thank you so much for joining us today, Oscar. It was a real pleasure. We had a lot of fun chatting, and hopefully our audience has become a lot better listeners, and we're expecting more questions next yes. month now that our audience is listening to us more intently. Thanks for listening. Thank you. 